Brilliant. Thanks, Bob. Let's just bow our heads to pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. We pray, Heavenly Father, that this would enable us to be, Christian, uh, to be courageous Christians. We thank you for those martyrs through the centuries who've witnessed to you to the point of death. We thank you that through the power of your Holy Spirit, they were raised to eternal life. And we pray this morning, Father, even though we may have to hear certain difficult and hard things, we would yet embrace your word. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, good morning. It's lovely to see you. We're in Hebrews today. We're finishing off our sermon series on the resurrection, which we've been, we've been in this, the theme of resurrection since Easter, more or less, apart from a few Sundays when we did other things. But we're finishing, we're closing that, that series today, um, where we're thinking about the resurrection, this great teaching of the Christian church, this teaching that only the Christian church possesses. No other religion comes close to saying what Christianity says. Namely, that in history, a man called Jesus Christ of Nazareth died. That he died for our sins. That he died for all the wicked things we do and for all the good things we don't do. He was buried. And then on the third day, rose from the dead. Which means that if you and I put our trust, our faith, our hope in this man, that although one day you will die and be buried, nevertheless, if you believe in this man, Jesus Christ of Nazareth, you'll be raised from death to life, life in all its fullness and in all its glory. Now this is what we've been looking at for weeks. But before I go any further, let me say this. It is a constant anxiety and worry of mine that some of you may as yet have not embraced this. Which means that although one day you will die, and one day you will also rise from the dead, you will not rise to the glorious life immortal. You will instead rise to an immortal life of everlasting shame and misery. You will instead, said Jesus, rise to weeping and wailing and gnashing of teeth forever. You say to me, that's shocking. That's outrageous. I agree with you. It is shocking. It's alarming. Believe me, I hesitate to say it. But you see, it's very, very easy for this to happen. Very easy. Because it's easy to think that you have faith and that you believe when in fact you don't. Which is why the Bible is always saying, examine yourself. Search yourself. Test yourself. So when the great question is asked on the day of judgment, You'll also, you'll, you will have already applied that question to yourself and found the answer. 
Because faith is made up of three parts, knowledge, assent, and trust. Knowledge. This simply means that you need to know certain things about Jesus Christ, certain facts about what he said and about what he did. Secondly, you need to give assent to those facts. You need to say to yourself, yes, those things are true. Jesus did say those things, and Jesus did do those things. And so you have knowledge, and you have assent. Now, my friends, most people, I shouldn't say that, many people stop right there. And they don't go on to trust. They never go on to say, I not only believe that he was crucified, that he was died, and that he was buried, but that he was crucified for me. He was buried for me. He rose again for me. Not just for the world, sins of the world in general. He died for my sins in particular. And he rose for my justification. That's what Paul said. Paul said, the life I now live in the body, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. Notice that. Paul did not say, I live by knowledge in the Son of God. He did not say, I live by assent in the Son of God. He said, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. Notice that intimacy. Notice that commitment. The wholehearted faith the personal faith, that real and living faith, that true faith that's made up of knowledge, assent, and trust. They may say to me, oh, well, thanks. Why are you saying that? It's a good question. The reason I'm saying that is because this, the people to whom this letter was written is addressed to men and women who had heard the gospel and to all intents and purposes, had embraced it. They'd taken it deep into their hearts and lives, but over time, they started to drift. The writer says that. He says, back in the early days when you first became Christians, when you received the truth, the light, you stood fast, you stood firm. When persecutions came, when you were mocked, when you lost your jobs, when your friends turned on you. He says, in those days, you're publicly exposed to insults and persecution. But you stood side by side, he said, with those who are being persecuted. Today, he might say, you spoke up for those Christians who are being mobbed on the internet. You liked their posts. You identified with them. You publicly showed sympathy for them when they were saying certain things on Twitter. You agreed with them in the face of the mob. When they were imprisoned, he says, you remembered them as if you were in prison with them. And then what happens? Well, of course, there was pushback. Their sympathy began to cost them. And he says, you joyfully accept this. Uh, this is amazing to me. You joyfully accepted the confiscation of your property. Let's just, think, just think about that. Fines came from authorities. You were fined. But nevertheless, you persisted. And the fines kept ratcheting up until you lost your property. But he says, you joyfully accepted that. Or you joyfully accepted the fact that mobs would break your windows and dispossess you of your homes. But in the midst of this, he says, you are full of joy. They joyfully accepted the confiscation of their property. 
But that was in the early days. Now things have started to change. Under waves of persecution, they began to draw back. And they began to drift away. The writer of the Hebrews says, you began to neglect your salvation. They stopped coming to church. They stopped meeting together. No doubt, no doubt they thought that when the crunch time came, they would be there. I'll be counted. I tell myself that all the time. Don't worry, Nigel, you'll be there. But here they're being warned. Do not think you'll go to prison for your faith if you can't even bother coming to church for your faith. They're drifting away. And so over and over again, you get these, I mean, these awesome, awesome warnings in the book of Hebrews. Listen to this. Pay more careful attention, therefore, to what you have heard so that you do not drift away. Now here's the punchline. For how shall you escape if you ignore such a great salvation? Listen to this. The Word of God is living and active, sharper than any double-edged sword. Nothing in all creation is hid from God's sight. Everything is uncovered and laid bare before the eyes of Him to whom we must give account. Listen to this. It is impossible for those who have once been enlightened, if they fall away, to be brought back to repentance because to their loss they are crucifying the Son of God all over again and subjecting Him to public disgrace. And so the writer to this letter is getting anxious that perhaps after everything, after all that, perhaps all they had was knowledge and assent but no trust. They began so well, but now... Now they're drawing back. Now I think it's really important that we, we as a church seriously start to think about this. Because a time of testing, bar, bar a great revival, which I pray for constantly, bar that a time of testing may soon be coming to the church in this country. And we may soon be asked, how real is your faith? Do you really believe those things you say you believe? Do you really believe, as the Christian church has always taught, that marriage is between a man and a woman for life? Do you really believe that? Well, let's just see, shall we? Let's see when the fines start rolling in. I've been reading recently, well, I found this guy called Paul Kingsnorth, He's an atheist. Well, he was an atheist, but he's recently converted to Eastern Orthodoxy. And he's now writing extensively on cultural issues. And he's saying we should all be aware that a foundational shift, a deep shift in our understanding of truth is exploding across the Western world. So much is the case that he says that up until almost last week, the meaning of commonly understood words that were understood from all time, by all, since time immemorial, are now being deeply questioned and no longer accepted. Like woman, for example. Why is this, says King's North? He says, the reason is our educational political systems are trying to reprogram society with an entirely new conception of the human body and so shift the very nature of biological reality. I would say, I mean, I agree with that, but I'd go further and say that our culture is trying to shift not just the very nature of biological reality, but the very nature of truth. And so the question for us is, will, will we stand? I mean, let's first of all pray that these questions never come. Let's pray that there's a revival. But if there isn't a revival, 
Where will we be in 15 years' time? So what we need is true faith. What we need is authentic trust. Now that's what Hebrews 11 is all about. And you can see that clearly in our reading today because what the writer of the Hebrews does is start to talk about men and women of faith and what they did and what they achieved. And so he tells us, he writes about Gideon and Barak and Samson. He writes about Jephthah, Samuel and the prophets and all that they managed to do by exercising this authentic real faith. He says they shut the mouth of lions, which is what Daniel did. Remember <laughs> when he was lowered into the lion's den? The lions shut the mouth. They quench the fury of the flames, he says, which is what Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego did when they were thrown into the fire pit and they emerged unscathed. It says not even the hairs smelt of smoke. <coughs> Amazing. Said, they said women received back their dead. Is that right? Women received back their dead, which the widow of Zarephath did when her son died of starvation. The child, Elisha, raised him from the dead. Still others conquered kingdoms and ministered justice, escaped the edge of the sword, became powerful in battle like Samson. In a single day with a jawbone of an ass, kills 30,000 Philistines. They routed foreign armies. And what is amazing about all those people is that to all intents and purposes they were finished. When Daniel was thrown to the lion's den, he was as good as dead. So they're all finished. But then just before calamity overtook them, at the nick of time, at the last moment, they rose, as it were, from the dead. And I love stories like that, don't you? It's great stories. That's why I love James Bond. <laughs> you know James Bond, I mean, what a hero. There he is, he's fighting the baddie on the top of the train. The guy pulls out a gun, shoots him, he falls into the sea, and you think, all right, it's over. But you know it's not, it's only five minutes into the film, so you know it's not over. But anyway, it's, a, it's incredibly surprising when you see him, uh, the next scene, he's on a tropical island, surrounded by beautiful women, drinking tequilas. <laughs> and you think, oh, that's fantastic. That's amazing. Now, I know James Bond isn't real, and it's written by secularists who don't believe the Bible. I know all that. But the reason why we like it is because it's so triumphant, it's so glorious, it's so wonderful. And so we, you know, what we Christians do, we say, well, we could have that sort of triumph in this life as well, can't we? Can't we be like Samson? Can't we be like Daniel? Can't we be like Shadrach, Meshach, Abednego? Just believe, and God will shrink the cancer. Don't worry. Don't you have faith? Just have faith and you'll be a millionaire tomorrow. And some people are. It does happen. There are many Christians who can witness to this. Let me not uh, make too much of myself, but I've experienced something like that. I just got married. Karen and I got married. We went to Philadelphia. We'd been married three months. We were 23 years old. I'd studied, I got a place to study at Westminster Theological Seminary, and we went over, Karen and I went over with $500 and no income stream. That's all we had in the world. After the first month's rent was paid in advance, we had $225 left. We were on our own, and we were desperate. We prayed and we worried. Now, I know, I know, we should have prayed and not worried. I know that's what real Christians do. But we did both. Why? Because we were full of faith and unbelief at one and the same time. But anyway, we prayed. It was an anxious time. I ate corn on the cob for about a week. I had a single cornflake for breakfast. Caroline found a cookbook called the Mennonite Cookbook. I tell you, I still break out in a sweat when I see it. There are lots of lentil recipes. 
I've never been as slim as I was back then, and there we were. A week later, we were down to our last $20, and we're about to hit the buffers big time. In America, there's no social security system whatsoever. All of a sudden, there was a letter dropped through the letterbox. It was from a lady in California, uh, Carolina. I'd never heard of her. Had no idea who she was. I'd never met her. I've never heard of her since. I had no idea how she got hold of my address. I had no idea how she knew that I even existed. But in the envelope, in the envelope was a check for $1,000. And a note that just said, you might find this useful. I tell you, I felt as if I'd been born again. I felt like Daniel, Shadrach, and Meshach, and Abednego, and the widow of Zarephath, and James Bond all at once. Karen and I thanked the Lord. We started to worry again. You see, these things happen. They do happen. Christians are rescued in the nick of time, at the last moment. The rescue comes through. But then the writer of the Hebrews goes on to say, there were others. That's really ominous, isn't it? Here you've got Daniel, Shadrach, Meshach, Abednego, the widow of Zarephath, Samson. And there were others who were not rescued. They were not rescued. They were not whisked to safety. They received no checks out of the blue. They were tortured, and they refused to recant. They were placed on the rack, and over days, slowly stretched. They were sewn into sacks with wild dogs and thrown into the sea. They were stoned. They were sawn in two. They were destitute, living in caves and in holes in the ground wandering about in deserts and clambering over mountains, clothed in sheepskins and goatskins, they, as if they were animals. The Apostle Paul says, this all happened to me, by the way. He says, five times, five times, I received the 40 lashes minus one. Did you ever wonder why it was 40 lashes minus one? Why 39? Why not the full 40? It wasn't the full 40 because the law, Deuteronomy, stipulated it could only be 40. And they're afraid that they might miscount and do 41 and therefore break the law. So they said, to be safe, let's just say 39. 39 lashes. Just over half were on the front, on the back of the body. Then they flipped you over and the rest were on the front. Five times. Can you imagine? I tell you, if somebody just said, we're just going to do it, I'd say, right, stop preaching by it, but I'm going. Five times. That was a Jewish method of punishment. The Romans used rods three times, says Paul. I was bitten, beaten by the rods, by the Romans. The rods were made out, made out of elm. Whippy, flexible sticks. They left the most appalling cuts and wheels. Unlike the ever victorious Roman Caesars, who boasted of their achievement in battle and in, in battle and in war, and who used to drag trained, chained and defeated kings behind their war chariots, Paul used to say, as he looked at those desperate, conquered men, that he used to look at those defeated kings, and he said, that's me. That's me. I am a defeated king. Because Jesus Christ has conquered me. On the Damascus road, I laid down my life and I gave it to him. I gave him my life. I threw my crown away. I'm no longer my own. I don't belong to myself. I belong to Jesus Christ. I'm his slave. And now, because I've been defeated and conquered by Jesus Christ of Nazareth, the King of kings and Lord of lords, he now leads me behind his victory parade. Paul wrote this, for it seems to me that God has put me on display at the end of the procession, like those condemned to die in the arena. I've been made a spectacle to the whole universe, 
to angels as well as to human beings. To this very hour, he says, I go hungry and thirsty. I am in rags. I am brutally treated. I am homeless. Now, I'm sorry. I'm sorry if this is really visceral. It's too much gory detail, perhaps. It may come of a shock to us. But I think we need to realize, just let's acknowledge this as being true for 99% of us. We all live in Nutsford terribly secure and safe lives, don't we? We really do. It's not wrong. It's just the way it is. But it's how we live. And for two years now, we've been told over and over again to stay safe, haven't we? Stay safe. I said it. Stay safe. And we should stay safe. We shouldn't be reckless. Especially in times of pandemic when our behavior can affect the well-being of others. That's a very, very Christian thing to do, to stay safe. But gee, sometimes it worries me that that attitude to stay safe has seeped over into our Christian lives as well. So that the injunction to stay safe means that we'll never do anything that will smack of danger or threaten our security. So that, what does that mean? That means we'll only ever take decisions that will leave the core of our lives essentially unthreatened. And I was thinking about this, I thought, well, did Jesus ever say to us, did he ever say, stay safe? What Jesus said is, if you follow me, it's going to be really, really dangerous. In fact, when people said, I'm going to follow you, Jesus, he used to say to them, no, 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 go away, I don't want you. It's far too easy to say, I'm going to follow you. Before you do that, says Jesus, sit down and count the cost. Don't come after me, says Jesus, unless you're serious. Why not, Jesus? Let's, let's listen to what Jesus said. If anyone would come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. What does that mean, to take up your cross? Jesus says, look, I, I'm, I'm the one. I'm the King of kings and Lord of lords, and I'm carrying a cross, and I'm going to carry that cross all the way to the mountain of crucifixion, and on the way to the cross, I'm going to be reviled hated, mistreated, and abused. I'm going to lose all my friends. I'm going to be loathed by my family, my tribe, and my nation. And if you become my disciples, says Jesus, don't think you're going to be greater than me. Because what they do to me, they're going to do to you as well. And you might lose everything. And that is definitely not a safe decision. That is a high risk decision. Now you say to me, who else thinks like that? And I'll say, let me say this. In the 20th century, there are 26 million martyrs. 26 million. And all of them will say to us, following Jesus can cost you your life. You say, wow. How do I do it then? Okay. Boy, if that's it, how, how do I do it? How do I get that faith? Well, let me put it like this. You've got to fix your eyes on something. You've got to really fix your eyes on something true and real because the writer of the Hebrews says there were others who refused to be released. Now, what? You know, if I was on the rack, I'd say, okay, what would you want me to say? I'll say it. Others, more courageous Christians... He says, refuse to be released. Why? Well, he says, they refuse to be released because they were seeking a better resurrection. What does that mean? A more glorious resurrection. What does that mean? Here's what it means. You see, there was this widow of Zarephath. She got her son back. Raised, as it were, to life. It was wonderful for Daniel to jump out of the lion's den 
And all of a sudden, he's back in this world. But what's going to happen to the widow of Zarephath's son, now that she's been resurrected back into this world? What's going to happen to Daniel, now that he escaped the lion's jaws? What's going to happen to him? They're going to die all over again. They're just going to come back into this world and go through the whole process all over again. You know, you know the story of Lazarus? I always feel sorry for Lazarus, don't you? He died. Martha and Mary are crying. They call for Jesus. Jesus takes three days to get there. He's in the tomb, and Jesus says, roll, roll back the stone. They say, well, don't do that. He stinks by now. No, no, roll back this tomb. And Jesus says, Lazarus! Can you imagine Lazarus in heaven? In glory. Raised the life of mortal. And he hears his voice, Lazarus. He's got to come back. He comes out of the grave, we're told, the shroud, blinking in the sunlight. Jesus says, take those shrouds off. There's stories, it's not in the Bible, but there's stories that he never laughed again. There's stories that he never spoke again. Because he was back in this world. And he knew he had to go through that whole process of death all over again. But you see, those who refused to be released, they were looking for a better resurrection. Not just to be resuscitated back into this world. I mean, that's lovely, but, you know... Goodness gracious, I'd want to be resurrected into glory, don't you? And so what they did is they didn't look at themselves. What they do is they looked at Jesus. And as they were being martyred, they looked at Jesus and they said, I'm united to Jesus by faith. This faith is an inseparable, unbreakable bond. Not because my faith is strong, it's because Jesus is going to hold on to me. Because by faith I've taken hold of him, I've grasped him. My soul has now been washed through his most precious blood so that I now live in him and he lives in me so that when I die, the moment that I die, I'll get back all that I've lost. I'll get it all back. All my possessions. In fact, I'm going to get greater possessions. Everything that I've lost is going to come flooding back to me. In glory. Why? Because I'm looking at Jesus, who was crucified, died, buried, and rose again from the dead. My friends, let me just say this. I've got to finish 32 minutes. Is this true of you? Is this your faith? Does this describe your faith? Knowledge, assent, trust, looking at Jesus, looking at glory. So that no matter what comes down the road, you have the resources to stand true and strong. If if, you know, if you if you say, Nigel, I'm not sure, I'm not sure if that's me. Just have a word with me at the end, and I may be able to help you. Let's bow our heads to pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word. It's such a challenge. And it comes as such a shock because it overturns the values of this world. Father, we thank you that we can face a better resurrection. We thank you that you promise us eternal glory. And that everything we have lost in this world because we follow you, you will give us back in abundance. Strengthen our faith to believe this, Father, and grant that we may follow you to the end. In Jesus' name.